Hi, I'm Rachel Chappell from North Shore Mums, and welcome to our Zoom session with Sarah Took. She is a registered nurse, midwife and childbirth educator, and over the next hour, she's going to be answering your questions about giving birth and having a baby in Australia during a lockdown. Um, but there's many other questions that are relevant to just general childbirth and education questions as well. But obviously the times that we're in at the moment, September, 2021, um, things are a little bit different for pregnant mums at the moment as well. So she will hopefully alleviate any concerns that you have um, and answer all your burning questions. Um, so let's dive right in and meet Sarah Took from Childbirth Education Online. Um, a, a few people have sent through questions, which is fantastic. So I've got a few little points um, to start off a bit of a conversation, but really guys, I want you to get the most out of this session with me. So feel free to type questions in the chat box and Rachel's gonna monitor that, or even just unmute yourself and come on and have a chat and ask a question because probably someone else is thinking the same thing. Um, I just wanted to firstly start the session just by validating um, this time for everybody how difficult it is with COVID and being pregnant. It, as Rachel said, you know, it, it's exciting, but it's also a really, you know, time filled with heightened anxiety and emotions. And then you chuck COVID in and this long lockdown and yeah, it is really tough. So hopefully you can get some info from me um, and see someone face to face kind of um, over the screen to get that information. So I thought we might start with the dreaded COVID topic because there were a couple of questions that came through and kind of what the hospital systems look like at the moment. Obviously I can't speak for every single hospital, um, but I can definitely give you some generalized ideas of what the lay of the land is at the moment which will probably change next month. Um, so at the moment, I'm seeing loads and loads of questions about partners and whether they're allowed into hospitals on the North Shore Mums Facebook page. Partners are absolutely allowed in and I work in um, a private hospital on the lower North Shore, as well as one in a high risk LGA. And even in that private hospital, um, partners are allowed in. We are encouraging that partners stay, if at all possible, to minimise risk by not going back out into the community, but they absolutely can come and go at the moment. It's not being policed. There's unfortunately no other visitors at the moment, including other children, if this isn't your first baby. Um, obviously, that is challenging, but it will hurt you probably more than it hurts your toddler um, if they're distracted with babysitters and grandparents and things like that. So try to just limit those calls and be kind to yourself when you are in hospital. And at the moment, many of the hospitals are providing meals for partners free of charge and things um, to sort of um, incentivize partners staying. They are asking that external food deliveries aren't um, brought into most hospitals to prevent crowding around the front doors at the moment. Um, and there isn't any face-to-face -face classes, whether it's antenatal or while you're in hospital after you give birth. So a lot of them have some virtual classes, um, but there's little QR codes around the hospital while you're in hospital. And there's some good online antenatal programs, which we'll talk about at the end of tonight's session, which I'm holding, which are proving really popular. Um, what else do you need to know about COVID? If you are required to be swapped um, prior to admission, the hospital will contact you. Um, and don't be afraid to ring the hospital. We understand that people are um, anxious and unsure at this time. And, you know, we are spending a lot of our day answering these kind of questions, but they will contact you if you are required to be swapped. Let's park COVID for a little while, but please do ask questions if there is um, anything else around that topic. Someone put through a question, Rachel, I think, um, with some labour questions. I thought that might be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the first question might have been about positions for birth and labour. Um, let me find that, sorry. Um, okay. Yeah, one, one lady asked, um, birthing positions that eliminate episiotomy. Okay, beautiful. So let's talk all things positions for labour. Um, we, I just want you to think of one word in labour, and that's gravity. Um, if you can not be flat on your back, that is optimal. If you think about pushing out a three kilo baby, try not to do it uphill. Yet let's use the resources that we actually have to help this process um, and help, especially with the pushing stage. 
But really, let's rewind to the first part of labour, that first stage when you're not actually actively pushing. There's two things that you need to think about, and that is having your legs apart. It doesn't matter how you do it, whether it's sitting on a chair, legs apart, sitting on a fit ball, leaning over the end of the bed, down on the floor, legs apart. Um, doesn't really matter how you do it if it's in the shower, in the bath and leaning forward, if at all possible. For the baby to get the best position in the pelvis, it's actually easier if the baby rotates around to the front of the mum. We call that an anterior position. And just by leaning forward with good contractions, that helps the baby to rotate into that optimal position and open up the pelvis as well. Just from leaning forward and having your legs apart, so simply, you're going to see my trackies now, but just leaning forward like this, legs apart, that pelvis open, um, you can get up to 28% more space in the pelvis. So that's quite significant. Um, so keep that in the back of your mind for most of the labor. When you are pushing, I want you to think about that tailbone, that if you're lying on it, it can't move or deflect out of the way. If we're upright, that tailbone can actually lift out, out of the way to open up that pelvis and legs apart. So when you are pushing, legs apart, off your back, and as upright as you possibly can be. Let's face it, lots of people choose to have epidurals and that's fine, but that does restrict you to the bed a little bit. So a fantastic position if you are exhausted or stuck um, you know, on the bed because of epidurals and things like that, your side is a fantastic position to give birth. And that actually does help to reduce perineal trauma as well, rather than a head sort of with all that pressure being bolt upright sitting. Um, onto that perineum there. Standing up is a really fantastic position to give birth if you're not too tired and you are able to be mobile or even simply just over onto all fours or even kneeling is a really good supported position as well and does reduce perineal trauma. While we're talking about that, um, a warm, wet compress in the second stage of labour, so when you're actually pushing, I tend to use for the women that I care for just an old school square cloth nappy get it in some really nice hot water, wring it out up against the perineum, just gently provide some support. And our evidence-based data does actually show that it reduces perineal trauma. So they'd be the things that I'd keep in the back of your mind for whoever did um, ask those questions. You can also talk to a women's health physio about some perineal massage or an epino to prepare antenatally, but that's also not for everybody. I would probably be thinking more about those positions we talked about. Um, and the warm wet compress as well. Just remember as well, everyone, um, you know, is a little bit different. Everyone's skin, you know, has different elasticity, different size babies, different size pelvis, um, you know, the way the second stage of labour is controlled. So all those variables come into place as well. Right. There was a question as well on that about breathing techniques for birth. Yeah, beautiful. I could spend two hours talking about breathing, but we obviously don't have the luxury of that time um, this evening. So the take home message for labor is just breathe. One of the benefits of breathing is to actually reduce those stress hormones. So our adrenaline, our noradrenaline, all our cortisols, which are actually counterproductive for birth. So we need these good labor hormones. We need to feel calm and relaxed. So we need our oxytocin, which is that hormone of love that causes contractions. Mm -hmm. We need high levels of endorphins, which are our pain relieving hormones. And we need levels of melatonin, um, which is that sleep hormone to work with oxytocin to get labor going. If we're really, really stressed and we have those high levels of adrenaline, it can actually switch off those other hormones. And it's that safety mechanism. Um, if we were out in the middle of nowhere and there was an animal or a threat to us and it's not safe to have our baby, it switches off or slows down labor. So keep that in the back of your mind and breathing will help to relax you and switch off that adrenaline. I know that I'm practicing my breathing techniques a lot at the moment with um, home learning with my children when I feel that adrenaline kick in and you can actually feel yourself calm down. I don't want to create you guys having large amounts of adrenaline because you're worried about not breathing properly. The take home message is just make sure you're not holding your breath and tensing up and having all those stress hormones. 
I would highly recommend um, some of those meditation apps that you can download on your phone. There's Smiling Mind, there's the Calm app, there's a whole heap through Beyond Blue um, that are for pregnancy and that are free. So jump on and grab some of those and you'll get the benefit for the rest of your pregnancy, but it will make this habit to actually use your breath a little bit normal, a little bit more normal when you do go into labour so that you can switch into that as a relaxation technique. The breath also um, allows optimal oxygen exchange to our working muscle, which is our big uterus, which reduces pain and helps it to perform better. So definitely keep that in the back of your mind. And this is where you need to chat to your support people as well to be on board to remind you to breathe because it sounds really simple, but we often forget these things. So it's just simply over the next few weeks, if you can you know, take five minutes out of your day just to do a meditation and work out how it is comfortable for you to do like a mindful breath and then to be able to tap into that. We really just want to slow the breath down and think with the out breath about letting everything go. And the midwives are fantastic at helping you to, um, you know, in labour to remind you to breathe as well. Mm. With second stage, the breathing is a little bit different and, it, um, you know, there's different techniques for different people but that would be more where we're sort of talking you through, you know, actually actively pushing and using the breath in a different way. When you're in that second stage and pushing, I want you to think a little bit about letting go of the pelvic floor and your bottom and actually allowing that to relax, although you are pushing at the same time. And again, I know I've said it before and I said it in the um, Zoom a few weeks ago, but the women's health physios are fantastic at checking that you can relax that pelvic floor and talking you through that with the breath as well. Um, but yeah, lots of childbirth programs will spend you know several hours talking you through the different breathing techniques. So you could definitely look into that as well. Hopefully that answers that question. Great. Um, while we're on birth, someone's asked about an epidural. Is there an optimal window in which to get this done? Mm -hmm. At what point should you be asking for an epidural? Okay, beautiful. So this answer will be different for first and second babies. I just want to debunk the myth that with first babies, it's pretty unlikely that it's too late to have an epidural. I would never say never because obstetrics surprises me every single day. Um, but in an ideal world, we would get at least into what we call active labour before an epidural, so at least kind of three centimetres, and that means we're then kind of having regular contractions as well. If we have an epidural before three centimetres, and let's face it, some people need to, and that's okay, we've got to, you know, do what we've got to do at the time, but if we can wait till three centimetres, it prevents it from slowing down or it can reduce the risk of the labour slowing down. Often in that first um, few centimetres, we're really still trying to build up those labour hormones, the oxytocin and things like that. And we really want gravity on our side and some pressure of the head on that cervix to create more labour hormones. If we're then stuck on a bed um, and our hormones haven't kicked in, that oxytocin isn't you know, right up here, it's more likely to slow it down. If your birth plan was... I've, you know, I'm making an informed choice that I definitely want to have an epidural and that will be the decision for quite a lot of people. I don't see the point in waiting till nine centimetres and not getting some of the benefit of it. Um, and it's kind of rushed at the end. But if you can wait till after three centimetres, that would be optimal. If the plan is you're just going to see how you go um, and ask for one, if you need it, like I said, first baby, it's pretty unlikely that it would be too late. If you were nine centimetres, we'd probably encourage you to keep going because you're doing so well. And, you know, we could almost have a baby in the same amount of time. We could get everything in. Um, but the midwives will be pretty supportive if they can get it in safely. Second and subsequent babies, if you definitely want an epidural, um, that's your plan, then ask once you're in active labour because you can go a little bit more quickly to pushing and baby out. Mm. Cool. Um, there's a question from someone who's um, at the end of 35 weeks. Her midwife has suggested she does another scan at 38 weeks to see the specialist to see if they might need to do a C-section because they believe she's got a big baby. Um, so she's just wondering how how would she be bigger? She's 2.8 20, 20, or 2800 at 34 weeks. So how is she bigger than her age in your opinion? Yeah, I think... Um it's a little bit hard to answer that specifically without kind of looking at 
whole situation. But if they are suspecting a slightly larger baby than that, you know, 50th percentile, it probably is worth having another scan just to have that information to be able to make an informed decision, which might mean, look, we do nothing and we just be aware. Um, and then, but at least you've got that data in front of you and you can have an informed conversation with your caregiver. We tend to not look at just one thing for sizes of babies. There's a whole heap of things that we would look at. And the first one would be the fundal height, which is where sometimes your obstetrician or midwife will measure your tummy from your pubic bone up to the top part or the fundus of that uterus and look to see if that's measuring a little bit larger than average. We then obviously use the ultrasound, which is not 100% accurate, but they're usually within a couple of hundred grams. Um, and then obviously clinical, you know, um, experience and what a baby should feel like roughly, that's, you know, 38 weeks. Then we can also look at the size, you know, of the pelvis. We can't really see that from the outside, but how we would gauge that would be more if the head has actually dropped down into that pelvis. We know at least if that's happened, usually for your first baby that happens at 35 to 37 weeks. We know that at least the baby can fit in the top part of that pelvis, which is great. We can tick that box. But maybe if we had a baby that was measuring larger than average, had an engaged ultrasound was confirming that, well, that's where you talk to your caregiver. Do we say, okay, we won't let you go overdue or we might induce you or maybe you choose to have a Caesar. Um, so over the next few weeks, you probably will get some good information if you do have that repeat scan at 38 weeks. Just one other thing with talking to caregivers. Um, sometimes you go in and you hear all this information, you don't know how to process it, you don't know how to ask questions because it's all a bit overwhelming. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of the BRAIN acronym. We use it in other you know, things as well, other conversations, not just medical conversations. But to go in and say, okay, what are the benefits, which is the B, what are the risks? And then basically, what are my alternatives? What is my intuition saying? And what if I say no? That can be a really good way mm -hmm. to actually um, communicate with your caregivers around that scan or around any kind of intervention. And it's actually okay to ask for more time and say, okay, that's great. We've got this information from the scan. We've had this conversation. Can I go home and process this and give you a call later this afternoon? And then you can put your thoughts together and actually run through that conversation using the BRAIN acronym. Great. That's a good suggestion. Um, I don't, there's no more questions at the moment mm -hmm. about birth. Is there anything else that you wanted to go through yeah. about birth? Um, I mean, well, there's probably a lot. No, no, there's a lot. I could talk <laughs> about birth all day. Like, um, you know, I do hours and hours and hours of this in my face-to-face -face and online programs. Yeah. So it's kind of like, where do you start? Yeah. Um, but I just want to maybe point out a few things of where you should be calling caregivers and then maybe move on to some postnatal planning, which yeah. can be done yeah. while you're pregnant. Yeah. Um, and I think people are scared to ring the hospitals because there's not a lot of face-to-face -face stuff and they think, oh, should I ring for this still or should I ring for that? It's still business as usual for us at the hospital for clinical things. So don't hesitate to ring the birthing suite um, of where you're actually having your baby if you're concerned about something. But things that you should be ringing up for uh, if you're concerned about any change in your baby's movements, don't ever be afraid to call about that. We get heaps of false alarms. The baby, you come in, we force you to rest, we put you on a monitor and the baby goes absolutely crazy and everyone's well. And that's exactly the outcome that we want when we talk about fetal movement. So always call if you're worried about that. Always call if there's any bleeding um, or pain that is, you know, that you don't think is normal that might be different to just pregnancy discomfort. Call if um, waters break and let your caregivers know, or if you think you're having contractions, give them a call. And depending on how many weeks you are and your situation, they'll guide you through when to come in. Great. Great. Um, someone's wondering what it actually feels like when you're pushing. How can you explain that? Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> how... Um, I'll often get people say to me, how do I know that I'm fully dilated and I'm ready to push? Yeah. If you have full sensation, like you don't have an epidural, most people will say to me as the midwife, I feel like I need to push. There's pressure in my bottom. I need to do a poo. 
or sometimes it's actually quite involuntary that you it's just this overwhelming urge to push while you're having a contraction because the head is just sitting quite low so what we want to do with the contraction for the pushing part is we want to use the power of this muscle just think of the uterus as a really big muscle it's far less scary if you think about it like that it's a really powerful muscle that's working really hard with these contractions to push the baby down rotate the baby and draw the bottom part of that uterus up which is the cervix to 10 centimeters or fully dilated when we're pushing, what we want to do is use the power of that contraction and usually the power of the diaphragm. We get generally get you to take a big, deep breath, hold the air and bear down into your bottom and go with that urge. Um, usually if we sort of support you to use that urge and then rest between contractions, it's, um, it's pretty successful. Um, I'm trying to think how to explain it. It is literally like having a really firm tummy that contraction if we feel it from the outside we can feel that the uterus is really tight and contracted like if you tighten any muscle it shortens those fibers and in between it relaxes and then when you're actually pushing you do have this just involuntary urge like you're going trying to go to the toilet right at the very end for the last couple of minutes as we start to see the head um, on view then you will start to get usually a little bit of stinging as that perineum and soft tissue stretches up. Everyone's incredibly frightened of this part, but I promise you this it is minutes. Once you feel that stinging and stretching, you know you're going to meet your baby pretty soon. That's probably the best way I can describe it. <laughs> That's encouraging. <laughs> yeah. Almost there. <laughs> yeah. Um, someone's asked about uh, what are the pros and cons of having a stretch and sweep? Um, her OB says her baby is in the per per perfect position, his head's engaged, ready to go, but on her 37-week scan, it says baby will be around 4.1 kilos, wide shoulders, the OB is suggesting a stretch and sweet at 38 plus four days. Okay, no so for those of you that don't know what a stretch and sweep is, it's basically an internal examination that your midwife or obstetrician can do, can simply be done in the rooms. And all they're basically doing is just kind of stirring everything up, going into that cervix and just trying to basically stir things up. And sometimes that's enough to get your own oxytocin going and um, sort of start mm. the labour. Sometimes it's not. I guess um, why some people would choose not to do it is because it's uncomfortable. Um, it's a little bit invasive and it's often not necessary, especially early on. However, if they're, again, back to big baby, um, you know, if the baby is measuring a little bit bigger and we're looking down the barrel of an induction, some people would prefer to try that and see if their body can, you know, make it happen on its own just with that before they sort of jump into other interventions. So I guess the worst that happens if you're thinking, well, I'll give it a go because I'm looking down the barrel of an induction is that it's uncomfortable and it doesn't work. Mm. Um, yeah. Right. Um, and someone's asked about how much movement you should expect from bub in the last few weeks. Yeah. So I want to debunk a myth that babies don't move less in the last few weeks of pregnancy. People will say, oh, you know, my friend told me that my baby shouldn't move as much because there's not a lot of room. That's not true. The movements can change as they have less room to flip around as they're taking up more space, but there should still be as many movements. By the end of the pregnancy, you probably start to know what's normal for your baby. So we kind of say, if that changes, let us know. Um, and it is okay to have periods in the day where the baby's asleep and they're not moving. So we say, you know, their sleep cycles are anywhere from 45 minutes to kind of an hour and a half. Um, if I tend to tell my clients, break the day down into little periods, into little chunks, you should kind of feel your baby move between getting up in the morning and, you know, starting work for the day, whether that's going in or, you know, logging in for the day from home at the moment. And you should feel your baby move from starting work and, you know, lunch, lunch to finishing up for the day and then dinner and it shouldn't just be like a little tiny movement there should be a good few obvious like at least 10 kicks when the baby is in an awake phase mm. um, and I would recommend everyone that's pregnant to get on the still aware website it's stillaware.org and they've got all the evidence-based up-to-date information about fetal movements great um, and just one other question is what is considered a big baby 
how, how long is a piece of string? Some people I've seen, you know, can't, will they have to go for a Caesar because a two and a half kilo baby just isn't compatible with their pelvis. And then I've seen women literally just, you know, push out a 4.5 kilo baby as if it's nothing as well. <laughs> so I think this is where um, you kind of have to, you know, look at the whole picture and all those variables with your caregiver you know, the size of the baby, that fundal height, back to ultrasound, has the baby engaged, other risk factors in the pregnancy, are you diabetic, all those kind of things. But we do say that macrosomia, so a baby that is macrosomic or very big is 4.5 kilos or above. Um, but most people would sort of start looking at bigger babies at that four kilo or above. But the definition of macrosomic is four and a half or bigger. All right. Um... There's another question that's just come through. I'm fully vaccinated against COVID when baby is born. How risky will it be for me to take the baby outside the house for errands, getting food, assuming they might get a bit of immunity from me? Note, I live on the Upper North Shore and not in any LGAs of concern. Okay, I wish I had a crystal ball and had all the information, but I, unfortunately, I don't think anyone does around COVID, but that's really positive um, that you're fully vaccinated. We do know like most vaccines, so most of you would have had your whooping cough ones if your third trimester, that some of those antibodies will go across the placenta and through the breast milk to provide some protection for your baby. And at least you're protected. So if you're out and about, you are less likely to shed quite, you know, as bigger viral loads basically, which protects your baby as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think we just have to make a risk assessment when we do open up because that is probably going to be happening in a few weeks following the media. Um, I would limit with the current climate, probably taking my baby into supermarkets and things like that if you don't have to. And I would say just be careful even in a pre-COVID world until they have those two month vaccinations anyway. Having said that at the moment in a lockdown, you know, people have worked out that washing their hands is a really good idea so in some ways it's reduced other illnesses like influenza and things like that but where you can I would be keeping the baby in a little bubble and you know for your own mental health getting out and just having a walk in open space and things like that with the baby in the pram which is pretty low risk rather than taking them into supermarkets and stuff like that just on the COVID vaccine um, topic as well, someone did submit a question which I didn't answer before, I forgot. Um, someone asked about, we, when they're asking about the COVID situation in the hospital, if it's mandatory for health professionals in hospitals to have the COVID vaccine. Um, so I just wanted to address that, that the public health order now does mandate everybody that works in a New South Wales hospital to be to have had their first vaccination by September 30, which is reassuring. Um, so yeah, that that hopefully answers that question. And most most health professionals in Sydney now would have had them anyway. But and I'm just saying, you know, I think at the hospital that I work at, I think 86% of people have had their first vaccine. But you've got to remember that 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 number is admin, cleaning, volunteers, things like that. So by 30 September, everyone has to have had their first dose. Great. Excellent. There's no more questions in the comments at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, shall we move? Yeah, we'll move on to postnatal planning, I think. Yeah. yeah, that sounds good. Beautiful. So as Rachel said in the intro this evening, um, a lot of people spend loads and loads of time planning and talking about birth, which is fantastic. Um, that's great. And I think it really does open conversations with your support team just to be on the same page. But a lot of people forget to actually talk about a plan for that postnatal period, which is probably even more important in some ways to have that conversation than around birth, because you guys are going to be home within a couple of days having this baby on your own. Um, and particularly at the moment with that village kind of not being quite as available as it normally would be. So um, I would like you guys to maybe think about having these conversations. So what do we talk about with postnatal planning? Thinking about that fourth trimester, I mentioned it on the Zoom call that we did um, here a week or so ago, that um, really biologically our babies are probably born a couple of months premature. Think about what a baby can do in another species when they're first born. Most of them get up and walk. Our little people can't even hold their own head up at birth. 
Um, and it is pretty biologically normal that this little person that is pretty vulnerable just wants to be here on your chest and be near you. And unfortunately, they're quite demanding um, because they probably should still be inside. So really, you only have to provide a couple of things to be an awesome parent. I find that quite reassuring. Um, in that first couple of months, you really need to keep your baby warm. And that can be by skin to skin and, you know, loads and loads of cuddles. You can't spoil a newborn baby. You need to make sure they're well fed. And you basically need to just, um, if they demand something, you know, obviously you need to have a shower and they do cry, that's okay. And sometimes you need to walk away, but just meeting their needs basically, which is love, closeness, that oxytocin, food and warmth. It's actually not more complicated than that. Although it's not complicated, it's incredibly demanding and time consuming. So this is where the postnatal plan comes in. How are we going to run our household and make sure we all eat and we all get some rest when we have this little person that's probably going to want to feed at least eight times in 24 hours? Think about um, asking people to drop off food. So meals, that's a big one. And heaps of people think to do that, which is amazing. Um, but thinking about things like snacks and lunches, especially when partners are back at work, um, often we eat the wrong things or we don't eat properly or we don't eat at all when partners are back at work because we can't, you know, go and make a sandwich or a salad or whatever. So asking people to drop off little snacks, cut up, you know, cheese, cut up fruit, things that you can eat with one hand and how that's going to work or even um, jumping in on one of those meal services. There's the pregnancy chef, you know, um, the gourmet dinner ladies, there's a whole range of them out there. So doing a bit of a Google search and even asking people to gift you those instead of flowers. Um, have a list of things on your fridge or just on your kitchen bench so that when someone walks in and says, can I do something for you? And you really want to say yes, but you're sort of so sleep deprived, you don't know what to ask them to do. You don't know where to start. You can go, okay, this needs to be done. This needs to be done and just direct them to the list so they can cross things off. I'm a bit of a visual person. I like to see at the end of the day that I've crossed a couple of things off and you feel like you can actually um, quantify what you've achieved that day, which is often hard with a newborn baby. Um, so things like that can be helpful. Depending on the COVID situation, um, outsourcing whatever you can afford to outsource with cleaning, pets, you know, dog walkers, um, getting help for other siblings, all those kind of things and having a chat with your partner about that. A big thing that I like people to think about with their postnatal planning is emotional well-being. Having um, a bit of a think about signs of anxiety and depression, what triggers are for you personally, because that will be different for everybody. Um, for some people, it's like, if I exercise for an hour a day, I know I'm okay. That's all I ask for is one hour. How are we going to plan that in? Even if it's just going for a walk around the block and we cut it down to 20 minutes at first, but just that time out and that exercise. And that can be for both parents as well. What is the trigger and how can we make sure that we can avoid that if at all possible and work together? Mm -hmm. And thinking about how much sleep you normally need and how we can try and achieve that in a 24-hour period. We need to look at the day as a 24-hour clock rather than just, you know, sleeping through the night. How can you get these little blocks of sleep and rest and share that load? Mm -hmm. um, thinking about some of those things can be good conversation starters. Yeah, there was a question earlier, actually, about, I mean, it's it's easier, you know, that sort of old age, you know, phrase of sleep when the baby sleeps. And it's challenging to do that with your first child, because you don't, you think, oh, I've got to do all those things on my to do list. But then if you've got an older child as well, a toddler jumping around that may not be napping anymore, finding those moments to sleep are even harder. <laughs> what What does one do? <laughs> Yeah, I know it's 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 not easy with your first baby, but it is, um, you know, much more challenging when you've got toddlers tearing around the house. Absolutely. You can't go back to bed after that six o'clock feed because bang, they're up um, and you're on for the day. So if you are in a position and COVID allows to have a care, you know, a grandparent or a friend or someone just come in for a couple of hours to make that happen, with partners working from home, could they log in a little bit later? So maybe you could go back to sleep for an hour or two before you start the day to get you through. Could they work a little bit later, um, you know, and take a slightly longer lunch break? And then can you do the reverse in the evening? Could one of you go to bed a little bit earlier to share that load? 
Um, and I am a big believer in quiet time during the day with toddlers, whether they sleep or not. And TV is okay. Um, they will be all right. So just use what you need to use to make do, to make sure that you do have a rest. And I mentioned this as well in the last Zoom. Um, I think as a society, and I'm guilty of doing the same thing, that we've forgotten what rest is. We think that just because we're sitting, if we're scrolling on our phone, we're doing our bills and we're sitting down with a cup of tea or a coffee, that that's resting. But it's actually not. We need to put the devices down and we need to actually switch off that stimulation, even if it's lying on the bed for 20 minutes or it's outside looking at nothing, just with your eyes closed or just looking out into space. And it's that mental kind of, you know, mm. down regulating really, really important. Yeah, I totally, I, that's one of the big things that I remember from the last session with you, like, because I'm so guilty of that is just, you know, oh, I've got five minutes, I'll just like go on my phone and check Facebook or whatever, but it's not resting, it's not, is it? Like, yeah. how often do you, I mean, I, that's what I need to do more is just go out in the sunshine and get a bit of vitamin D just for five minutes, but yeah. there's always a to-do list, there's always, oh, I've got to do that or whatever, but. And I feel like mindfulness gets thrown around a little bit and then it just becomes another bloody thing on the to-do list and yeah. it becomes stressful because <laughs> mindfulness is this big thing at the moment, but it can be so simple. Again, mm. overcomplicating that. It can be a mindful cup of tea that you stand there and you're not scrolling on your phone like I did earlier, you know, while the kettle's boiling, that you're just standing there looking out the kitchen window while that's happening you're aware of the temperature, you pick up your carp, you look at the pattern on the carp, and then you might actually sit outside for five minutes and think about the temperature and how you're feeling and what it feels like in your mouth. That's a mindful cup of tea that can take five minutes yeah. but makes all the difference. Mm. That's good advice. Um, witching hour. Uh, with my first baby, we struggled a lot with witching hour and purple crying at night during the first 10 weeks. Any tips on how to help with this the second time around? The witching hour. Yeah, and they usually wait till after two weeks to start this because they make sure that you've fallen in love. Um, they And they're, they're quite sleepy. They're still those really little newborns in that first two weeks. It's always sort of week three that they start to wake up. Babies are wired to be nocturnal. That's the point that I want to make here. And we all get so focused about babies sleeping through the night. I wish we could eliminate that a little bit, although it would be great because we like to get our sleep at night. Babies are wired to call out at that time as the sun's going down. I think I mentioned this last time and with labour that it's the safest time for a baby to feed biologically with those melatonin levels higher. If you think about other animals, it's dark so that threats can't, you know, other threats can't find us, other predators. Um, you're not tending to other children. You're not out hunting and gathering. So those night feeds and unfortunately just having your baby close to you in those witching, in that witching hour, which is definitely longer than an hour, by the way, um, is probably it's just pushing through cuddling not worrying about causing bad habits probably the best thing that I did with my kids was just have one of those little bounces because they often just wanted to look at me I'd swaddle them you know a typical midwife swaddled within an inch of their life they'd be slightly propped up with that little bit of a tummy ache at the end of the day they were probably overtired had a bath just gave them access to the breast and then popped them down in a little bouncer and I could do it with my foot while I was eating dinner and often they just lie there but they were quiet they're in that quiet alert phase where they weren't screaming they weren't asleep, which stressed me out because I was like, you're so tired. But at least you could actually, you know, eat your dinner with two hands. So I think it is sharing the load at that time. Whatever works and lower your expectations, this will pass. Um, but that's where it is challenging when you've got toddlers that you're trying to put to bed and do dinner time and things like that. So again, your postnatal planning, thinking about pre-preparing meals for toddlers and the family putting meals on in the slow cooker in the morning when the baby's less unsettled. But mm. usually that does pass by about 10 to 12 weeks. Right. Um, there was a question that came through um, earlier um, about breastfeeding. This mum mm -hmm. had a lot of difficulty breastfeeding with her first baby. Um, she has flat nipples and incredible midwives spent a lot of time with her to help her getting the feeding going and she ended up using nipple sheets, shields for six months but she'd love to avoid these difficulties with bub number two do you have any suggestions would antenatal expressing of colostrum help yeah so um 
look, sometimes second baby, at least you have the confidence to know that you've done it before. Um, and often with flat nipples, when you have breastfed, they, the baby has actually drawn the nipple out a little bit by the time you have baby number two, so fingers crossed. But it's not an uncommon thing that we see in hospital with women with flat nipples. Mm. Really annoying in the first few days and frustrating for those women, but usually we can get there. So I guess the thing with breastfeeding is we probably overcomplicate that as well, and that conflicting advice is incredibly frustrating. Mm. Um, but really, going back to basics, when the placenta comes out, that's kind of the handbrake for lactation. So it doesn't matter how the um, baby and the placenta come out, whether it's cesarean, or whether it's vaginal birth, the handbrake has been released for breastfeeding hormones. And from that point on, it is simply supply and demand. If we want to be able to breastfeed, we need to have skin to skin with our baby and we need to stimulate, ideally with a baby, but otherwise by hand in the early days or a breast pump to make sure that supply comes in. So that's what the focus is, I guess, if baby isn't able to attach in those early days is um, lots of skin to skin, making sure the baby's fed, whether that's express breast milk, breast milk or formula or a combination until we can get a nipple shield on. We tend to not introduce nipple shields until there's um, a breast milk, you know, a flow, which is sort of somewhere after 48 hours, usually around day three. Um, and before that, that's where we would either hand express or pump and give the baby what we can give them. Hopefully, then we can get off the shield, but that's where I'd recommend a lactation consultant um, to sort of guide you through that. With the antenatal hand expressing, I know we talked about this on the last Zoom as well, um, that can be beneficial to build up a little bit of a supply in the freezer to take into hospital of colostrum. So that in those early days, if the baby is a bit unsettled, they're a bit mucousy, which they normally are when they're first born, they've got a tummy full of amniotic fluid, they're tired, they're recovering from birth as well, or they can't attach or whatever the situation is, we've got some colostrum up our sleeves to not have to jump straight to formula if that's your preference. So with antenatal hand expressing, it's a relatively new concept um, and it basically came about where they did a study called the DANE trial and it was done on women who had diabetes, whether it was type 1, type 2 or insulin, um, sorry, or gestational diabetes. Um, and they basically thought if these women have expressible colostrum when they're pregnant, if we can collect a little bit, will this reduce the amount of formula those babies need in those early weeks? And it did show that. So now women are doing it even if they don't have gestational diabetes. We would say start after 36 weeks, run it by your caregiver because they will know if there's any risk factors or reasons why we shouldn't do the antenatal hand expressing. If you don't have any colostrum, don't stress. You've given it a red hot shot. Just enjoy the last few weeks of your pregnancy. If you do have some and you feel comfortable doing it, that's awesome. We don't recommend getting on a pump. You simply use your thumb and your finger and you go back towards the chest wall and then down to the nipple and we generally get you to collect it into a syringe and then you can store breast milk in the fridge for three days or in the freezer for three months and we'll just get you to label it with the date and time and then bring it into the hospital frozen if you don't use it you can take it home great um someone's asked is there a easy way to get the babies to adjust to daytime schedules from their nocturnal nature faster yeah, again, I wish I had a magic wand for that one. Um, but it really is time, unfortunately. But little tips that we'll kind of say is um, expose the baby to natural light in the morning and then late in the afternoon to help those rhythms kick over. But kind of like if we're jet lagged, you just want to stay in the, you know, when we could travel, when you want to stay in that dark hotel room in the middle of the day because you're absolutely exhausted and all your rhythms are out of whack. But if you go out for a walk, it often helps that to kick over a little bit sooner. So it can simply be if you've got a veranda or a room that's got nice natural light in the morning and in the afternoon, go for a walk with the baby in the pram. That can sometimes help as well. We, you could also try not to let the baby have that five hour stretch during the day. Um, most babies don't go five hours that are newborn, by the way. But, you know, if you are going to get one longer window, maybe we would say kind of, you know, maybe looking at waking the baby between three to four hours if they haven't woken to hopefully get that longer stretch at night. Um, but sometimes you're fighting a losing battle. If they don't want to feed, they don't want to feed. Um, but you can definitely give that a go, trying not to let them go too long during the day to help that clock over as well. 
We also say when we start to look at routines, I'm not a massive fan of time-based routines, especially in those early weeks because they just don't work and they often cause more stress than good. Older babies, different story, yes. Um, but thinking like, you know, in the evening of having a bit of a wind down routine in that witching hour where they often want to have those couple of feeds that are quite close mm -hmm. together that you might do a feed, then a bath and then another little feed. And that's kind of wind down time. During the night, having, you know, not having the TV blaring and Facebook, you know, with that blue screen right next to their head that you're scrolling through and all the down lights on. Once they're down for the night, maybe doing those feeds just with a lamp or the hall light on. And during the day, there is a bit of noise and the TV's on and the lights are on and there's a little bit more stimulation and interaction with your baby. Um, during the day, lots of eye contact through feeds and forming those little emotional pathways. But at night time, your needs are here to be met. And I understand you need to be fed, you need your nappy change, and you need a bit of a cuddle to go back to bed, but we're not here to party overnight. That sometimes helps those sleep associations as well. Great. Um, just before you mentioned, um, at, you know, from an early age, you don't have a routine, but when they're slightly bigger, it's good to start to introduce a little bit of a routine. From what sort of months would you say? I would say sort of, you know, the end of that fourth trimester. Some people around that six to eight week mark when um, the peak unsettled behaviour is kind of kicking in with crying um, starting to look for some of the baby's cues. I would say more starting to read your baby's cues and following their lead rather than focusing on a rigid routine at this point. Get to know your baby in those early weeks. Work out what they're doing when they're hungry. Hungry signs for young babies are, you know, rooting around, looking for the breast, tongue in and out, smacking their lips, trying to actually suck on something, bringing their hands up. And then their little tired signs, which are sometimes mistaken for boredom, uh, you know, breaking eye contact, heavy eyes, um, fierce developing fists and jerky movements, and then starting to grizzle and cry. I find with brand newborns in those first few weeks, you really pretty much just feed them and then they're just about ready to go back to bed. But as they get more efficient with the feeds, as they get a little bit older, starting to look for those signs, once you start to see those tired signs, that's when you wind down pretty quickly, wrapping or, you know, shushing and a bit of a cuddle or whatever it is, and then popping your baby down to sleep. One thing that I often see when we see those tired signs is parents checking the nappy again and, you know, taking 20 minutes to do that. Check it at the end of the feed, unless it's really obviously soiled, you're probably just going to wind them up when they're showing you those um, tired signs. So that's where I'd be doing your wrapping and your swaddling and your shushing and popping your baby down to sleep. Okay, great. Um, someone's asked, do you have any tips for solo parents for the fourth trimester? Yeah, definitely. We're seeing more and more solo parents and I take my hat off to you. I think you're incredible and brave to be doing this solo. Um, and you, you know, it's, it's amazing, but you do need that support. So find your support and your village and do that now and give people some clear ideas and instructions of what you need from them and have a bit of a roster set up, work out who can come over. And don't worry about entertaining those people. It's not a visit if they're your village. It's that person that's actually going to come and hold the baby and sit there and not be offended if you go up to bed for an hour or two or hold the baby while you have a shower. Um, outsource that washing even if they want to take it home to their house and just make sure that you keep talking. I think that's the big thing, especially with emotional well-being, whether it's on you know, FaceTime or the phone and just checking in with those people around you. Yeah, very good advice. You can as well, um, if things open up, jumping into um, you know, the parent support groups, mothers groups run by the early childhood centres. If things go back to normal little you know, baby um, music things at the library, that kind of thing, and forming a bit of a network that way can be really good as well. Yeah. Definitely. Um, a question. I'm 30 weeks pregnant and I walk after mealtimes to lower my sugars due to gestational diabetes. I feel pressure down there after a 30 minute walk. Is that normal? 
yeah, that's pretty normal. No one ever tells you about that. I would still run that one by your midwife or obstetrician or whoever your caregiver is anyway, just to make sure that there's nothing else going on. But you have often a big hormone surge at around that 28 to 30 weeks. Everything is loosening up. You have all that beautiful relaxant to allow that pelvis to kind of move. It is soft and it can feel heavy and like there's a lot of pressure down there. Um, the support garments that you can get are helpful with that. Um, and it's great that you're walking to lower those sugars and just get out for your mental health as well. But I know SRC do like the leggings and the shorts, which provide that support underneath and around that pelvis, which might make it a little bit more comfortable for your walks as well. Okay, great. Um, someone's just asked, do you know when you think the mother's groups might be running in person face-to-face? or over zoom <laughs> what are they doing at the moment i wish i did uh, some of them are running them over zoom the problem is every single council because they're run by council is doing something different yeah. so i'm even confused um yeah. i would just encourage you to reach out to whoever your council early childhood center is and ask them what they're doing the problem is they probably don't know because they're watching to see what's going to happen when we open up um, with numbers, whether they do open up at the same time or they're a little, you know, they hold back a little bit. Um, but I, th I thought most of them were doing them through Zoom at least, um, but maybe not. I wish I had the answer for that question. Yeah, it's so tricky, isn't it? It's just not having that mother's group is so hard for particularly yeah. first-time mums, but even second and third-time mums that are looking to connect with other mums with babies in the area so I guess I guess if you if they do offer it via zoom still turn up yeah. and I've heard of people that you know do it over whatsapp they just have a tiny little group just in their area on whatsapp that they will ask questions and stuff yeah, but, um, absolutely. yeah. and also you know of course we've got the North Shore Mum Bumps and Bubs group as well which is a great way if you want to you know when things open up and there's not um maybe if there's not a face-to-face -face mother's group feel I've seen so many lovely people meet friends through North Shore Mums and Bumps and Bubs just say I live in Lane Cove and I've got a four-week-old baby and if anyone wants to meet me for a coffee or a sit in the park you know don't don't feel embarrassed about doing that because I mean I know it feels can feel awkward but so many people meet people that way Absolutely. And especially for those of you who, you know, you've missed that three month window, if we open up after that, if you're about to have your baby, and then they're prioritising those really young babies, absolutely reach out. Yeah, always reach out. Like there's people that wish they'd done it earlier or are too scared to do it. And they're glad that you've done it. So just go for yeah. it. <laughs> especially at the moment when families are interstate and, you know, overseas and things like that as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, a question, I'm, I haven't read this one yet, but I'm pregnant with my first baby and my mum's very keen to come and help, but she lives in the state. I'm more anxious about this than anything else as she can be fairly bossy, but I know it's silly not to accept help that's available. Do you have any tips to manage relatives, first time grandparents, etc.? Yeah, proud control. <laughs> for that, kind of. Um, however, um, look, the distance can be great, but then when they do come up, they often want to stay, which can be really, really challenging, especially when you're vulnerable and you're sleep deprived mm -hmm. and you're trying to navigate this time with your partner and it's all a bit overwhelming. I would suggest having difficult conversations now while you've actually got reserves to have them because you won't have any reserves when you have your baby and it's easier to put ground rules in place now. So maybe you could suggest that you're really, really happy for that help and you really want them to be a part of this journey, but could we look at an Airbnb or a service department or something just so we have the option to come and go so that we're not all on top of each other? Um, you know, and living together and maybe having those boundaries and writing those tasks and saying, I'm going to get you to do X, Y and Z while you're here and that's your job. And that's where that conversation around postnatal planning needs to come in with partners if you've got one to then go, OK, what are we expecting from these people? Because their idea of support might be very, very different to yours. Absolutely. Um, I think I've asked all the questions that have come through so far um unless it's almost 8 30 if there's anyone wants to quickly turn on their mic and ask any questions don't be shy 
Um, it might be quicker than me reading out questions. So don't be, don't be scared. <laughs> And um, just while we're waiting, oh, hang on, Jenny, have you turned your mic? Yeah, so I just have a, a quick question just around colostrum and collecting it um, and taking it to the hospital. I've heard varying numbers of what people collect. So I'm just, um, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering how much I've collected versus what's good for the baby and, and also yep. how the safest way to take it to the hospital. Yeah, how much have you got, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, I think I have between seven and 10 uh, mils. Beautiful. Well done. That's awesome. Thanks. Yeah. And you know what? Some people get absolutely nothing and that's no indication as to what your milk supply is going to be like later on. Mm -hmm. um, some people get half a meal and some people come in with 30 mils. It just really depends. But anything you've got is amazing. So keep it. And the best way to bring it in is just with a little ice brick in like an insulated bag. Um, and then we have specific breast milk freezers um, and fridges they're treated mm -hmm. like a drug basically and we monitor the temperatures and there's a log in and log out to make sure that we give you the right breast milk and things like that to eliminate any errors so just bring it in in a little fridgy bag and we'll pop it in and if you if you need to take it home we'll send it home with you perfect thank you very much that's okay and I think I just saw out of the corner of my eye someone ask about where you get the syringes yes okay. yep. yeah you buy the syringes Perfect. So you can either get them from the pharmacy um, or some hospitals will provide them. I know most of them don't unless you're diabetic, just because otherwise they'd be giving them out left, right and centre. Um, on my online shop, and we can put the website up later, I stock a few products, which I think are awesome. That's not my main business, but I get asked a lot about some really awesome products. Um, and one of them is called Made to Milk and they've got little antenatal expressing kits. They're really cute. They're in a little pink bamboo container, which can go in the freezer. They've got the syringes in different sizes. They've got the little caps that screw on so they don't accidentally squirt out. They've got typed up and printed out labels so you know what you need to actually write on them. And they've got a little illustrated card with instructions on how to do it. Um, and even a little cup in case you're able to get a little bit more and it's easier to express into the cup and then draw it up in the syringe. And they're like, I think they're about $39.95. So if you're thinking of doing it, um, they're a really good way um, to just have everything there at hand as well. Is that the antenatal colostrum expressing kit? That's it, yep. Okay, I'll just pop the link. I just found it on your website. So I'll Perfect. pop the link to the shop there. So $39.95 for those. Um, someone also had asked, I just saw, are uh, recovery shorts necessary and why? They're not necessary, but they're amazing. I strongly recommend them for everybody. Um, I do, look, there's heaps of really good brands out there, but I do think, although they're a little bit more expensive, the SRC ones are better. I do think you get what you pay for. Um, they do the shorts and the leggings. They do pregnancy and recovery. Um, so basically what they are is like a support garment. Think of them as the old Spanx basically. And they come up after you have the baby up over your belly because all, you've got all those nice softening and relaxing hormones on board. So all those tummy muscles relax and separate and the pelvis is all a bit loose. And I know a three or four kilo baby doesn't sound like a lot, but eight hours a day of feeding and leaning in and out of bassinets and prams and all that kind of thing um, it will help to support that pelvis and that back and it just helps everything kind of go down and that um, fluid retention as well what I like better about those than a binder is that you actually get that support underneath as well and there's some evidence with that medical grade compression that if it's applied against a wound whether it's on the perineum or on the tummy with the caesar that it promotes blood supply and healing um, but they do require you know just don't guess your size they're very different to a fashion garment um, i sell them on my website as well and if you want me to do a zoom um, or facetime kind of quick consult for helping you to measure i'm absolutely happy to do that for my clients as well Great. Um, I can't see any other questions at the moment, so we could wind it up because it is 8.30 and <clears throat> I'm sure everyone's getting tired. <laughs> You've been amazing. Thank you. Give, give a little plug for your online course, Sarah, because this is really just a taster of all, you know, there's so much more to learn. <laughs> 
so much more to learn. Um, and often you don't know what you don't know, especially with your first baby. Um, so obviously at the moment, face-to-face -face classes are cancelled. I normally do those, but I've got three awesome online programs to meet everybody's different needs. So there's a full childbirth and parenting program, which covers everything about labour, Caesars and parenting. I've got a Caesar and parenting one for those that know they're having a planned Caesar. And then I also sell just the parenting modules. They're pre-recorded, so it's not death by Zoom. You get all the slides, you get downloadable handouts. You can re-watch it as many times as you like for 12 months. And in addition to that, because I don't like to just shove people online with no access to me, you get access to my calendar to jump into Q&A calls and we can have a really good chat. You can jump in as many times as you like in that 12 months. Um, and we can have a chat and you know ask more questions like tonight on top of the content that you've learned through the modules. Fantastic. That was great. Any final questions for Sarah or shall we wrap it up? Quick, turn your mic on if you've got any. No, I think I think we're good. We cool. can always um, continue this if people maybe on the, in the Bumps and Bubs group, if yeah. can they ask post questions there and tag you? Tag me um, and then we can always, you know, talk through Messenger or I can answer the question publicly because probably other people are thinking the same thing as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight and thank you, Sarah, for sharing your amazing knowledge with all these pregnant mums. It's such so, a important time. But <laughs> Everybody, all the best. Um, look after yourselves and yeah, hopefully the world goes back to being a little bit more normal soon. Yes, we're getting there, aren't we? Slowly. That's wonderful. You. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Later. Bye.